I'm, I'm so excited for you all to get to meet Andrew Dillon. <clears throat> he is um, he's one of the people that that we're excited to have because he's not one of the usual suspects in healthcare, right? He comes from the School of Information, and he uh, he brings a very broad, very interesting perspective to this discussion. He's a computer scientist and he's a psychologist, and. Um, where are you, Andrew? Why don't you talk to them just a little bit uh, about yourself and about the iSchool and the values of schools of information because we need to be engaging them much more in our discussions. Well, thanks, Julian. Good morning, everyone. And uh, well, I'll be very brief on that one, but there, there is an emerging class of, of schools being created uh, called Schools of Information. There are now 33 of us around the world. We were one of the first schools started at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, the mission of schools like ours is to gather interdisciplinary experts together to study the social impact of information as it transforms our life, as it transforms and creates a new kind of infrastructure that we live through. And the applications are uh, across all domains. So what's very fascinating about our school and in my job in particular is I get to work with computer scientists, psychologists, other social scientists, historians, philosophers, library scientists, uh, humanities scholars, all concerned with aspects of managing this uh, tsunami of information that's coming at us and looking at how it plays out in real contexts for real people in real lives. And I think you, you, you could hardly get anything more real than the story you just heard from uh, Julie five minutes ago, which I think sets us up perfectly for the panel that we have here, here today. And let me just very, very briefly introduce the groups we have and then let me set some ground rules for how I'd like us to proceed because we have very little time. But uh, the distinguished speakers, panelists I have here with me are Lily Coney, who is the Associate Director of the Electronic Privacy Information Center. Now, I have the names slightly out of order, so if you just wave your hands when I call your name so that people will, will, will know who you are. Uh, Dan Dien, uh, John Savo, Director of uh, Global Procurement Relations for CA Technologies. Anne Cook, uh, Research Professor uh, in the Department of Psychology and Director of the National Rural Bioethics Project at the University of Montana. Manisha Mittal is the Associate Director of the uh, Federal Trade Commission's Division of Privacy and Identity Protection. Bill Sage, colleague of mine, University of Texas, Vice Provost for Health Affairs, and he also holds the uh, James R. Doherty Chair for Faculty Excellence in the School of Law. And Pablo Molina, is, uh, an Associate Vice President for Information Technology and Campus Chief Information Officer at Georgetown University here. I think when we talk about patient-centeredness, there's an ideal, at least that some of us who come out of the systems and information systems design world have, which is that patients truly being at the center and at the core are involved in uh, the complete design of the system. But it would strike me as a slight outsider that patients in this world don't have a lot of understanding of what's going on at health information records. Anne, what do you think? Well, we've been uh, conducting studies of uh, patient decision making um, when both receiving health care and when participating in clinical research. And our studies show that um, in order to sort of understand how their information is used, they really have to understand kind of who does what to whom and how. And patients really have virtually no understanding of patient privacy. Uh, that was the finding from our biggest patient study that we did, uh, they really did not know how the information would be used or who would have access to it, um, how long, for how long a time information would be available. Um, so in, in a sense, to believe that there's a kind of a, a crisis in privacy would suggest that people would know that there was a problem, but people really don't know enough about privacy to know that there could potentially be a problem. And we found this a particularly interesting uh, situation as medicine has moved sort of from a covenant to more of a commodity. And as research has become um, almost completely infused with clinical care, um, research trials have moved from uh, academic medical centers into private physician offices and clinics and hospitals. And so patients via the electronic medical record are just almost immediately being moved from the first appointment on into both a research and, and um, clinical care stream. And they really don't understand much about that whole process. Anyone else? John. Yeah, uh, just a comment, uh, it is reflecting on uh, earlier 
comments and the stories we've we've heard in a way it's like asking patients uh, or putting ourselves in the role of a patient saying let's walk from washington to toledo but you won't have a compass and you don't have a map and i think it's very hard with with respect to health information flows <laughs> and the kind of stories we heard. It's very hard to, um, for patients to understand anything without a roadmap or transparency into the system to some degree. And I think that's one of the large obstacles we're dealing with uh, today, and including in the standards community. Um, yes, I, I was gonna say that um, I think that there's, people have some vague understanding, I think, that there's some protections in place when they go to their hospital or their doctor's office. But I think there's a vast universe out there um, where uh, uh, consumers are not covered by HIPAA or any laws. So if people are using apps or social networks or websites, um, and so I think you know, not only is transparency a problem there, but there's a problem with lack of any protections. I, I would add that there are, is even a problem with people who patients come in contact with understanding how data is actually used. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who deliver the privacy statement and get the signatures. Um, there are uh, assumptions that there are protections that are there and enforceable. Uh, and even if the patient asks the person who handed them the privacy policy details about that, they may not be able to get any more information that's on that mm -hmm. statement. And in addition to that, people who are in compliance, who are responsible for protecting data, uh, may be focused on the compliance piece, but not understand that there are uses of data that would, would threaten the privacy of that data, or the, uh, lim uh, the idea that there is a limitation on use may not actually be the con the condition of the data that they're responsible for protecting. So how do we improve that situation? If that, that's the reality on the ground. How do we, how do we make it better? Education and uh, patient involvement. Um, there, I think the biggest challenge is that the more patients know about how their record, their d medical information may be used, there may be a perception that it may uh, limit the willingness of patients to volunteer information. Okay. So dealing with the transparency component, which is a key provision for privacy protection, um, has to be real and substantive. And, and I think that is a critical goal. Manisha, and then John. I think in addition to consumer education, uh, there has to be education of those who collect consumers' data and maintain consumers' data, that if they misuse that data, uh, if they violate consumers' privacy rights, there will be consequences. Uh, and certainly, um, uh, at the Federal Trade Commission, we brought cases against companies that have not maintained reasonable security over consumers' data. Just recently, we announced a case against a debt collector um, that was uh, collecting debts on behalf of hospitals, and an employee of the debt collector downloaded P2P software peer-to-peer -peer software on their work computer and inadvertently shared thousands and thousands of consumers' files onto the P2P networks. Uh, and so we uh, sued this debt collector for not maintaining reasonable security of consumers' information, um, and now they are required to undergo periodic audits uh, of their security practices. And, um, and so I, I think you know, generating publicity for these types of actions and showing people that there will be consequences for violating consumers' privacy uh, is one way to, um, to generate publicity and education about the importance of this issue. John, then Pepper. Uh, just a, a quick comment. Howard Schmidt, who's the uh, um, administration's uh, cybersecurity coordinator, in, in his public talks often makes the comment about his, his mother, and uh, who's very elderly, and how you can't expect uh, her to receive the level of education around cybersecurity best practices that you might expect of someone who's in the industry and much younger. And therefore, there's an expectation that the systems that are built will incorporate trust, accountability, uh, achieve the right kind of policy interoperability that's necessary to deliver the trust, and that the individual, while needing education, doesn't necessarily have to become a PhD in the systems they're using. Those systems uh, are, uh, should operate effectively, efficiently, and with the right levels of security and privacy assurance. I wanted to make a point of saying that I co-chair a technical committee in the standards organization called OASIS, and OASIS develops a number of keystone security standards that are used in online systems today internationally. 
we're uh, developing a privacy reference model and methodology specification, and I would, it, you'll see that it impacts maybe some of the other statements I'm going to make, but I would recommend that if you're interested in this whole area of how do you map the data flows and the policy flows and the interrelationship of policies and requirements around privacy and security, take a look at the spec. It's a OASIS. Uh, dash open dot org and just look for privacy and it's under a 30 day review now but it gets to the point of helping architects for these systems as well as policies and program managers understand the map of the interoperability of these systems and how to build in privacy by design in effect well, I think that a key component uh, in the solution is technology. Technology is wonderful. About uh, 10 minutes ago, I just hung up with my online meeting with two uh, refugees in the Kakuma camp in Kenya that I'm guiding on an online internship. But it also has some really negative uh, connotations. And since we're in a law school, I'd like to cite a legal opinion. Why not? Judge Aldiser in 2006, who wrote, no invention in humankind can let you, let you get faster into more problems than computers with the notable exception of tequila and handguns. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens is, is this, is that uh, we are designing uh, technologies that uh, we don't know very well how they work, and there are a lot of uh, people ready to abuse those technologies, not only companies trying to make money, but also bad guys. And there are governments producing malware. You may have read about uh, the authorship of the Stuxnet uh, worm, uh, by the United States, as well as the discovery of the flame and malware this particular week. And those cyber weapons are not like tanks or missiles. Those things uh, can end up in the hands of anybody, anybody in this room. And with a little bit of technology knowledge, and not a lot to be honest, you can recycle some of that information and some of that malware and use it, for example, to tap into the health records of uh, people that you don't like, your enemies, your political opponents, candidates for employments, uh, romantic rivals, or anybody else who do, don't happen to like. And this is why we need to design better technology with more uh, security and privacy uh, safeguards. Well, we heard the expression privacy by design here, but I'm still struggling to understand how do the patients get involved in shaping this? To, to what extent is this done just by the technologists, by the clinicians, by the big stakeholders who've got a financial investment here? Where are the patients in all this? Well, I think there's a huge hurdle in uh, creating an op a responsibility that patients need to understand the details right. of the technology in order to trust the technology. I mean, we drive cars every day, and how many people could actually put one together? Uh, we, if you need a surgical procedure, do you need to know how to actually perform that procedure? Um, we ran into some of the same issues with um, other like electronic voting systems. Mm -hmm. Do people really need to understand how these systems are put together? We may be creating a high hurdle. What has to happen is that there are persons or entities of trust who are independent, have no skin in the game, who can evaluate these systems and say they meet uh, the, the requirements of providing the uh, privacy protections that patients expect and this is in Pablo's area, but if it's possible to do that to a degree of confidence, that's what we focus on and, and try to communicate to consumers and be able to back that up with um, routine evaluations of those systems. Okay. Uh, Manisha then, Bill. Yeah, I just want to piggyback off the couple of points that have been made that um, I, I absolutely believe transparency is very, very important. But I, at the same time, I don't think we should put the burden on the consumers to sift through a privacy policy and say, you know, this company has good security and this company has bad security. Right. Security should just be built in. It shouldn't be up to the consumer to, or it shouldn't be in the hands of the consumer. The consumer shouldn't be burdened by having to compare different privacy policies on that issue. Um, I think there was a, a, it was well publicized about a year ago, there was a British gaming company that included a clause in their privacy policy saying that, um, you know, you agree to sell your soul to the devil and to opt out, click here. Um, well, of course, you know, nobody opted out. Um, and so I think that just shows that we shouldn't be placing so much of a burden on the consumer to read through privacy policies that would take lifetimes to do if they read privacy policies of every company that they were doing business with. Well, there's actually an episode of South Park that goes much to that same theme. Um, let me say something about uh, law and then try to bring this a little bit back to medical care. I mean, on the law side, if you take the title, you know, does technology harm patients? Well, technology harms lots of people because of the way we define harm. 
um, people have made the case within kind of tort law that modern negligence law is almost all an outgrowth of technology to begin with, that the whole notion of harm and the redress of harm and how we approach it from a legal perspective uh, is often a, a result of responding to technological change. So whether technology is some, in some abstract sense good or bad doesn't really matter so much as if you are going to contemplate harm and that it's something that a legal system is going to respond to, yeah, technology produces lots of harm. Um, let's go back to medical care, though. So you asked, Andrew, um, whether patients, um, how, are, how are patients going to get involved to fix this? Well, um, I think uh, first thing to say is uh, we talk a lot about how health care needs to be improved in this country and then how um, information and information technology are going to help improve health care. Um, the often unstated fact that underlies those accurate statements is that healthcare in this country right now isn't very good. Um, and when you start thinking about the ways it isn't very good, then you start thinking, well, patients actually need to be more directly involved in their care in order to make it better. Uh, and my sense is that actually technology on the whole is going to very much facilitate that process, the same way that a lot of um, jobs for law students and law graduates are going away because technology facilitates the involvement of ordinary people in resolving their own legal problems. Technology is going to facilitate ordinary people getting involved in their medical problems. Uh, and I'll stop preaching. I'm a law professor. I'm used to doing this. Um, and then when you call on me again, I'll talk a little bit more about the <laughs> provider side here. Okay, good. John. So I think that uh, in order to improve the situation, it's a multi-stakeholder problem. You need uh, government officials, you need corporations, you need citizens, you need civil society, health practitioners, and technologists. I'm going to borrow on a, on a model to, for the adoption of technology and shaping the behavior of people using technology from Larry Lessig, uh, who tells us that you know, if you want to modify how people use uh, technology and organizations efficiently, you can do it through four modalities. The first one, you pass laws and uh, regulations and legislation. Uh, the second part is you change the norms of society, what's acceptable and not acceptable to people. The third part is you use economic incentives and disincentives in the form of fines and other rewards that you can use. But the last one that is terribly important here is through code. You use the architecture of the technology systems to make sure that those people who are managing that information, those organizations, are doing so with the right level of information assurance. And then John. Yeah, just to picking up on that, the incentives issue, um, if you think about it um, from a patient perspective, uh, analog analogously, you can't expect uh, all of us as individuals to uh, using our own individual incentives to design uh, traffic light systems in a big city because it would be total chaos. And in the case of uh, healthcare in the U.S., you've got HIPAA, high tech, et cetera. You've got a body of regulations and expectations. You also have incentives of providers, uh, and multiple incentives to do the right thing. So you put all those things together. What are the missing ingredients to build the trusted systems that uh, individuals and patients as well as the other parties and stakeholders in the systems can rely on. And I think harnessing those incentives and then turning, and again, I'm a very big believer in harnessing uh, the standards community, look to establishing the sets of practices, technical interoperability and other standards, security standards that can be pulled together and, and codified so that systems will operate as expected, they'll be predictable, trusted, and then the exceptions uh, we heard about earlier in the patient stories will truly be exceptions and won't be uh, emblems for regularity in terms of how these systems operate. I, I Just a reason I can I feel strongly about it. I, I worked in my first career for the Social Security Administration and when I first started it was a mainframe uh, I'm a technology policist, it was a policy a technologist, it was a mainframe based system with terminals in 1,400 field offices. And many, many standardized uh, act, you know, interactions with the field representatives and the systems were thrown out as exceptions because the system had not captured how to, how to automate and to deal with these policy exceptions. And so errors were very high, uh, and uh, the ability to uh, ensure quality service and reduce costs slowly had to be addressed. And over time, the agency did that over a long 10, 15 year period so that they re reduced the exception processing to a minimum. Qualitative standards went up, 
conformance went up, et cetera. It doesn't say there are not exceptions that are anecdotally important and, and they are getting work, but I think that is a very big key. Design the system from the beginning, not just to say we're gonna be reflective of privacy policy, but to build it into the system. And the system isn't just the enterprise any longer, it's completely networked. So uh, it's a complex task, but I think that's the only path to doing, to doing it. Okay, Lily, and then and then Bill. Right, I, I found a report that was published in November 2011, and I thought it was a very, inter they made some interesting points. It's the Institute of Medicine Committee on Patient Privacy and Health Information Technology. It's part of the National Academies. Uh, they published a report, uh, pa Patient Safety Building, Safer Systems for Better Care. They made an excellent point that the, it's not just a matter of technology of uh, hardware, software, and firmware, that it encompasses a technical system of computers, but it also has social technical systems where people are integral parts of the uh, health IT system, and that we don't really know much about how this is going to all play out. And this is the point where you want to start longitudinal studies mm -hmm. to see mm -hmm. if we're going to see a d decrease in the 44 to 98,000 lives that are lost through the medical era, whether there will be negative impacts because of how IT is used for patients, um, that the expectations are there that it will, that it will have only positive benefits, but that we do need to start looking at the real outcomes and also use that information to improve systems that are being uh, introduced. And, and then Bill, and you've been very patient. Well, I, I think part of the challenge is we talk about things like, well, education and patient empowerment, but we don't really spend a lot of time looking and thinking about how people actually make decisions. And um, when we were conducting our studies, we were really interested in looking at, um, you know, what what did patients do or think when they read their like the HIPAA privacy statements, and and what did patients do and and think when they uh, read informed consent forms, even consent forms that were written supposedly like at the eighth grade level or something, and uh, the the sample we were working with, uh, fifty percent of whom had at least um, some years of college education or more. What we found was that patients were almost completely unable to translate information in the consent form and make it relevant to their lives. So they had no idea what the privacy statements meant. They had no idea um, what the risk statements meant or how they should be applied to their lives. Um, they had no idea how the data was going to be used. And many patients pointed out that if they didn't sign, they couldn't get care. Mm -hmm. And so they really had no choice. So that in order to reduce cognitive dissonance, the choice was to sign and not think about it. Because if, if you thought about it, that might be rather complex, but you sign because that was the only opportunity to get care. And so um, as a substitute, a proxy for understanding how your information was going to be used, um, patients employed what we call the fourfold trust. They absolutely trusted that the physician would never release information that was private, that a hospital they trusted would never release information to anybody else that was private, that the government wouldn't allow the release of information that was private, and that, uh, and that the outcome would be that, that this was being done for the good of mankind, um, that, that, that there were these elements of protection. So the idea that patients could be part of the technology solution is is elusive because they have so little understanding. Um, but it's not just patients. When we ask clinicians, uh, we were interested in asking, when we interviewed and worked with physicians across the country, we, were, we asked them, are, are patients concerned about um, biobanking and data sharing? And, uh, you know, pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics. And what they said is, uh, not at all because they don't understand any of that. And they said, but then we don't either. We just send blood samples away and we know they'll be used for something 20 years down the road, but we don't know how. And so that really um, inhibits one's ability to get really involved in thinking about repercussions. You want to address that point, Bill? Well, I want to address a couple of these together, <laughs> if that's okay. Now, uh, so um, thinking about those comments on consent forms for research and putting it together uh, with what John was saying about traffic lights, and I, I'm not sure I agree with you and for the following okay. reason. Um, so let's get back to my basic premise, which is the American healthcare system isn't really very good and uh, needs to get better or we're all broke and unhealthy. Mm -hmm. um, so then you say it's not going to get better by 
decree. Uh, there's not going to be centralized policy that makes it better. It's going to get better organically with the right incentives and the right um, sort of infrastructure that allows it to improve. Um, so, you know, traffic lights are a great example. Um, I actually think individuals determining their own traffic lights would make traffic lights work far better rather than far worse. Because in most cities, um, it's the fact that all of these cycles are preset and not responsive to individual need, collectively expressed, that results in all manner of jams. And if people weren't you know, not sort of going through the list and checking off which light should be green when, but sending information um, about their needs for traffic light to be green at a particular time, um, traffic lights will likely get better and technology can facilitate that. Technology can also facilitate um, the process of research consent being better because a lot of these default processes we have are really kind of crappy. And unless there is an input that continues to improve them incrementally, we're not going to get very far. Um, let me stop there, and I still have some more I want to talk about, but we'll come back to it. May, may, I, may I retort the traffic light uh, <laughs> attack by my colleague here? Uh, the, the point, uh, which I didn't make very artfully, was that uh, I think you're correct. In the aggregate, uh, it gets a little bit to the uh, aggregated health records. In the aggregate, uh, data flowing from vehicles in an area as they approach light could help improve the cycling of the lights. My point was that each individual driver can't simply hit the green button uh, at their own option because you'll have chaos and so on. And I, I think that, that was the distinction I was trying to make. I think the system actually could be designed to be much more effective in the way you described it, uh, but not on an individual control basis for that purpose. No, but an individual input basis, and I input, think that yes. actually yep. could make a big difference in healthcare too. Yeah, in the input basis, right. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go to Manisha. Before I do, let me just do a bit of a house call and say that even though there's 15 minutes for Q&A at the end, I'd actually invite your questions at any point. So if you feel like reacting and getting up, come to the microphone, get my attention, and I'll introduce you into the conversation. Do it, please. Manisha. So I just wanted to make one point about privacy by design. I think we've been really focusing on, on technology, which is important, and it's the title of the panel. Um, but I don't think when we say privacy by design, we mean just leave it to the engineers to design the systems. I think there's lots of components of privacy by design. There's employee training. There's access controls. So, you know, does does everybody need to have access to this information? How do we limit access to the information? So there's a lot of human elements that I don't want to get lost in the discussion of technology. Uh, I want to add one thing about the transparency and, and medical research or just transparency in general. There are different experiences from different communities that um, are, have negative connotations with medical treatment and research being combined. Most of the privacy policy statements I've seen also include language about for research purposes. I think that it would be very important, especially to engage communities, to have forums like this mm. specifically looking at transparency on those issues and the, uh, the uh, National Research Act, which intended to address those, to broaden the dialogue to get buy-in. Uh, and that the privacy statements and research statements should be separate statements. But I think people with transparency and, and inclusion, some of these issues that we fear would happen if we don't get people into research one, one way or another uh, would hinder research, would actually make it more of something that people would opt into with f greater transparency. Um, and then the second piece on transparency is that even prescription medication records at pharmacies are being data mined, and most patients don't know that. Mm -hmm. So transparency on those pieces are also important. Yeah, I think there's a vital point we, sort of, we, we may miss, which comes out in these sorts of comments. When we talk about patient-centered design, or in the world I live in, it's user-centered design. It isn't about educating users to understand the technology. It's actually us educating the design community to understand the world that the user lives in mm -hmm. and to create the artifacts and the technology that works in that socio-technical space. So I don't want, I'd hate to think we would advocate giving users better understanding of these awful forms that they have to read, rather that we redesign the forms. And I think that's most important. But let me, let me, let me go to the floor and, get, and get, get some input here. I have a question, because I'm here for very personal reasons. Could you reasons. introduce yourself as well? Oh, my uh, name is Abby Green. I'm from New York. I'm here for very personal reasons. I paid for this trip on my own. I took the time off on my own, because as a clinician, I'm having some ethical dilemma. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping in the next day and a half, I'll be able to solve that, or at least think about it some more. 
Um, I'm a clinician in a methadone clinic of over 300 patients in a psychiatric hospital that's part of a hospital system of 14 hospitals in New York. So it's a huge, huge system that I belong to. And we went to um, electronic charts a few years ago, and now we have a new director who wants us to put everything in the charts. Mm -hmm. And it's psychiatric. And so I have my 20-year-old who told me she's stealing from her grandmother to support her habit. I have things that I'm hearing that I don't want to put in a chart and have go out there not knowing who's going to have access to it. This girl, for years, someone might have access to that information. I have worse information than that, you know, um, some pretty horrific things. And when I sit there typing it and pressing the send button or whatever it is at the end of the day, I don't feel good. No. And as a clinician, I want some answers. Mm -hmm. so. Some answers, please. Yeah, I, I, I would offer that there is a lot more going on with access to health information, um, not just uh, health and human services, not just Medicare, but the Department of Homeland Security has uh, key social networking search terms that include outbreak, contamination, exposure, TB, just lots of terms that if you search, if you search on these terms, there's a hit and there's uh, uh, something happens within that agency regarding that. There's also a program that the Center for Disease Control uh, has uh, is d really went back and revamped uh, starting in 2010 to provide access to health public health information that's being collected. So the sensitivity of data, the information that's put online, these systems are being designed to share information, not to put up firewalls, but to share information across um, um, entities and institutions that provide health information and how that information might be used later. Once it's put in digital form, there's no pulling it back. And I think that's a, a, a very, very important aspect of uh, the topics that we'll be discussing. after I put this in the chart. And they said, well, most people don't open up psychiatric, but of course, the emergency room okay. does have psychiatric information. So if she should come in with a broken ankle six months later, mm -hmm. someone in the ER is opening up and finding out that she steals from her grandmother, I, I can't in conscience put this information in unless I know what's But I, I think what's the, the critical component of this is that the, the way the system is designed, the data may not stay within the hospital system, that hospital facility. Mm -hmm. It may be going to other entities outside, and that becomes a critical question on transparency and Bill, accountability. And, and then and John. Uh, okay, I think that's a, it's a wonderful question and a very helpful anecdote for, for discussion. Um, let me talk a little bit about information in medical care. Um, did I mention that American medical care isn't very good? <laughs> um, okay. If I, if I didn't, let me mention that. So let's talk about a couple of ways in terms of information. Um, and one, I get to share a personally embarrassing story. It's mildly embarrassing. It's not like the seriously embarrassing stories that some people earlier today were willing to share with the audience. But I teach health law, which means I teach HIPAA, which means I'm supposed to know something about the HIPAA privacy regulations. Um, and I realized um, I had been making a mistake teaching this for several years, and Professor Rothstein here corrected my mistake a couple of years ago. I'm very grateful, Mark, for you doing that. Um, my mistake was when I learned about um, HIPAA, um, as I read through the titles and the guidances, I was very much taken by this notion of minimum necessary disclosure, that you only shared the information you absolutely needed. Um, and I would teach students enthusiastically about why this was actually a breakthrough moment in information policy and healthcare. Um, and then several years later, um, Mark uh, informed me uh, that actually minimum necessary standards didn't apply to information shared for treatment purposes. Um, okay, so here's one of the ways in which American healthcare is kind of not so good and it relates to information. We have all been trained as physicians that you need to know every piece of information that's possible to know about a patient because that might be the key information that guides you to the treatment. That is simply wrong, okay? So we have a long tradition in medical culture of having too much information too little knowledge and um, few incentives to act on what is really important quickly to get to the right outcome. So you have to think about all this information that's in the system and how much is just based on kind of 
antiquated culture of medicine and how much is actually relevant for what we want to do going forward and within a particular field and here you know there are several people in the room who are I might Medical training was in anesthesiology, not in, in psychiatry. Um, but there's the people in the room who know this in, in great detail, and maybe someone will respond at some point. But you have to ask yourself, how did all of these detailed psychiatric notes come to exist in the first place? What was it about the training in the field, the history of the field, the way that um, interactions with patients and with support systems grew up that caused all this information to be placed here to begin with? And it's a good way of reevaluating field by field whether you really do need that much information in the records for anybody's purpose and then I would certainly say that in a modern industrial health care system that can prioritize and act on what it really needs to know it does not need to know everything a, a doctor through idle curiosity should not have access to information that is actually harmful rather than helpful in treating a particular condition John well you know, the, 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 these, the, these panels are not going to solve the, um, the long-standing cultural and practices and traditions of a particular uh, profession or discipline or sub-discipline within a profession, but that's a very important component of looking at the design of systems. And I think it's to the point um, one of my colleagues made earlier about this isn't just technology, it's about the U utilization, uh, integration, and adoption of the right sets of technologies to support the policies. Well, first you have to do that high-level analysis of what those policies should be, and maybe you have to have a willingness to confront tradition and practice and say, we can't build this into the system. I think your point is, an exact, is exactly right. For our um, model that we're developing as a standard in OASIS uh, privacy management reference uh, model methodology it's built on use case analysis the first stage of this model says you do an overview of a use case you can't just talk about the healthcare system mm -hmm. you have to look at a use case you've provided a use case I'm not saying you know I, I know enough about it as a practical matter but you're keying things into a system because the system is designed for you to key things into it to maintain your records and then to transmit them God knows where in our model you would say I'm defining the use case I'm defining the data flows I'm defining what I'm collecting etc cetera, etc cetera. I, I don't have time to get into it and then you build the controls, you, you, you define the controls, and then you build the functionality you need to do that. And in your case, it may mean separating, whether you're forced to do this by tradition or practice or whatever, separating data that's not relevant to um, uh, clinical treatment from data that's only relevant to your interview or your, uh, uh, et cetera. There's got to be some distinction. You can tag the data, you can separate it, you can control access to pieces of it. So technology can do some of that, but I think I'm correct. I, I believe you can't do it all without having done an evaluation of this new system, mm -hmm. understanding technology, and that's what we're trying to build in this model to help, you know, help policymakers, architects, uh, practitioners deal with these issues. It, it is slightly worrying, though, from an outside point of view, to hear even doctors complain that they feel like slaves to a system. Mm -hmm. And that, that says to me there's something radically wrong in the way that we're doing things. And I would agree with Bill, going right back into the training of how people collect this data and think about what is valuable and what should be used raises some fundamental questions. But yes, by 10.45, we're not going to solve it. But we're here for two days. So, you know, we, we can make everything. <laughs> Let me invite that next question. You've been waiting a long time yeah. on the floor. My name is Gwen Melchoir, and I am a student at George Washington University in the Health IT program. And I have two questions. Um, the first is, how much is my medical identity worth on the black market? And the second question <laughs> is, other than asking for a photo ID, what steps can a provider take to prevent uh, medical identity theft? Anyone want to estimate a value? Can you, can you give me your uh, SSN and other identifying information? <laughs> you, you look very healthy to me. I'd give $1,000 for your profile. <laughs> Do I hear any higher? 1010 <laughs> I mean, I mean, in seriousness, you, you have a whole uh, black market in, um, in access to all levels of personal information for various reasons, and it's, 
I mean, I, you can now see the value of a, a name, a mother's maiden name, it's social security number, it's pretty inexpensive, it's, it doesn't have a lot of value in, you know, you couple that with credit, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, market incentives for the bad guys to do this, and that's what's driving a lot of the hacking that's going on now, but uh, I, I haven't seen data on the particular value of certain medical related information. I think it's going to be contextual, but it's out there, so it's a legitimate concern. I think you have a great paper topic in your hands, mm -hmm. so if you want me to talk to your professor, I'll be happy to do that. So, okay. uh, uh, and then uh, I was going to say, I think there's, a, uh, in terms of your second question, what steps can a provider take to prevent medical identity theft, there's a little bit of a conundrum here, because I think one thing we say is, well, you know, you can do a better job of authenticating uh, people when they walk in the door. Well, what does it mean to authenticate somebody? You get their social security number, you get, you know, a lot of information, and then there you go, you have a treasure trove for identity thieves to steal people's information. Um, so uh, so I think we, you know, we have some, you know, if you take a look at our website, ftc.gov, we have some business education materials on how to, um, how to protect people's information, how to safeguard people's information. Um, you know, don't don't retain. So maybe you take a social security number and you don't retain it. Um, so there's there's lots of things that providers can do, um, and I think um, uh, we have some information on our website about that. Right. I second that. They have an excellent page on medical identity theft. It's a really a new form of identity theft, and uh, there are a lot of victims out there. The first place that you should look is on your credit report. Everyone, the, the hard work of the FTC um, and the, re the reauthorization of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, you have access to a free annual credit report from all three of the major credit reporting agencies. It's the real free one. It's not the one you they say is free. Uh, but you should look at that, because if there is any unpaid medical bills, it's going to show up on that report. The second issue is asking questions when you are asked for identifying information when you go into your doctor's office. I, for years, have not given them a social security number, and they haven't refused treatment. Um, encouraging them, even though the insurance providers stop using social security numbers on your medical ID card uh, because of the problem of identity theft. So there is some movement, but there needs to be greater public awareness about this particular problem. And it does threaten lives, because of incorrect information, as the, the patient um, uh, case that was discussed, uh, is in your medical file, there can be some serious consequences. Oh. Yes. Can you introduce yourself, please? If I may, also David Smith, it doesn't have to be very valuable to be worth stealing because it's very easy to steal. So if it's worth five dollars, they'll still suck it up. It, it, uh, we have to be very careful. Before we have any more from the floor, let me just say we've had a, a, a questioner waiting there patiently for the last five minutes. Please introduce yourself and, and let us know what your query is. Um, my name is Suchi. I'm currently with the CDT, but I was formerly a graduate of the University of Texas's HIT program, and I've worked in industry for a little over a year. Um, first, just an observation. It was incredibly depressing to hear us all knowingly laugh when uh, William Sage said, America's health care sucks. Mm -hmm. So... Um, just maybe a call to our collective conscience about that. Perhaps something can change there. My actual question was, where are we going to put the responsibility for privacy policies <laughs> yeah. overall? Because as Anne was saying, when I worked in the industry, I said, you know what, I'm gonna make up my own privacy policy and take it in, because I can understand what they're handing me, but clearly my information is going to go somewhere where I don't want to. So I made one for myself, and I made one for people I knew, I said, take it into your physicians and see what they say. Nobody wants to change from bottom. So my question is, who are we supposed to rely on? Because it's not the vendors. As a vendor, my incentive is to make money and to work around, which if you haven't worked in industry, 
here's a big clue in. The whole name of the game is how can I work around your policies? So all the policies you set, I'm going to figure out a workaround to make it easier for the physician and for my thing to get accredited and brought out as quickly as possible to meet meaningful use. Mm -hmm. And meet, I can put in quotation marks. So where are we going to put the responsibility and who can we go to at the top to see that physicians are able to ensure that their patients have actual privacy and confidentiality and security? Uh, there's two key components to, uh, there has to be a entity that has the authority, like the Federal Trade Commission <laughs> or the Health and Human Services Agency, to enforce a, an established regulatory scheme for that. So we have a HIPAA, which is a rule that was written based on a law. The rule could be stronger. And, and actually was an initial rule that was very strong, but it was replaced with a rule that opened up the door for more sharing or more uh, uses for data. But once you establish a strong rule, you do need to have an authorizing authority with the power to walk in and say what the rule is, whether an entity is following the rule or not following the rule, and they have to be able to apply some kind of leverage to make it create an incentive for following the rule. Uh, versus it's more profitable for us to write our own rule and, and or to figure out workarounds for the rule than to actually adhere to the regulation in a very strict way. Okay, lots of people trying to get in here. Pablo, you were first. Yeah. I teach um, ethics, and this is a classical ethical problem. It's called the problem of many hands. Because there are many people involved, everybody assumes it's somebody else's responsibility. It would be akin to the case of Genovese, who was killed outside her apartment in New York with 38 neighbors looking, and nobody did anything or called the police. So what happens is this, we look at the uh, health practice, I'm sure the health practitioners and the doctors, they're all subject to the Hippocratic Oath, but nobody else in this ecosystem has any rules of professional responsibility. You know, I'm CIO here at the campus and my highest degree is a doctorish of liberal studies. And uh, I didn't have to uh, subject to any oath of privacy or security or anything like that. So I would argue that once again this multi-stakeholder problem has to be addressed by everybody involved and that the legislation and the penalties for not compliance ought to go across the board. We're not talking only about responsibility. We're talking about another word that does not exist in many other languages like Spanish or French, which is accountability. People taking actions for the role within the health ecosystem. Uh, so I just want to make two points um, in response to the last comment. So um, first, um, the uh, questioner talked about getting around the privacy policy. Um, so one thing, uh, the, the main law that the Federal Trade Commission enforces is a law that prohibits any misrepresentation made in commerce. Uh, and so we have uh, sued companies for falsely representing that they would protect information that they didn't. Um, you know, one uh, example is our case against Google. Um, Google, when users signed up for Gmail, they said, um, we will only use your information um, to provide you email services. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what they did in 2010 was they tried to create a social network. Uh, so they took your top 25 most frequently emailed contacts and they created a social network out of that information. Some of those contacts included doctors and patients, psychiatrists and patients, um, people looking for jobs, other sensitive information. So, so that's the first point, that there is a law that protects consumers against misrepresentations made in privacy policies. Um, second, as to kind of who to place the burden on, um, one of the things that we've said, and we, you know, a lot of people say it over and over, nobody reads privacy policies. So our view at the Federal Trade Commission has been, you take the most important information, for example, do I share information with marketers? And you have to take that outside of the privacy policy. You can't bury that in the privacy policy. You can't ask uh, consumers to say, oh, by reading this privacy policy, you agree to X. You take that out of the privacy policy. You put it in a pop-up window if you're dealing with a, um, a website, or you put it you know, on a separate form that the consumer signs. You take those important choices out of the privacy policy. It's not a perfect solution, but it's at least better than just having uh, reliance on the privacy policies. I'm ha I have my own problem of many hands here, and I forgot that Anne had her hand up uh, earlier. Well, first. Um, the, the part of our problem is one of, of agency. I mean, uh, the, the word accountability is interesting, but we, we think of the physician as wanting very much to protect the patient's um, information. But the physician also has other kinds of responsibilities. And, and I mentioned earlier, we were very interested in this um, trend of, of research 
clinical research moving into private practices and institutes and hospitals and even very rural hospitals. And so increasingly clinicians uh, across the country um, during key informant interviews have told us that clinical research is used to underwrite a significant portion of their office expenses. It generates anywhere from 20 to 40 percent, some say, of their office expenses. And so they are very much um, interested in uh, enrolling patients as efficiently as possible into clinical research as a part of providing clinical care. So while the physician is interested in protecting the patient's um, information. They're also interested in fulfilling the clinical trial and giving as much information as possible and needed uh, to the sponsors of that trial. And so you, you really have, uh, I mean, so the information flow is much broader than it would be if the physician was just providing clinical care. But in fact, there's the physician has this kind of in between role where he is responsible to. Uh, the, the industry supporting the trial, and he's responsible to the patient. And so um, it makes for a very fluid exchange of information. Okay, I, I, I wanted to say something about the privacy state policies, and now actually I have something I think is even more important to say. Let me say quickly about the privacy policy. I find the privacy policy is really odd. Um, I think we all understand that patients don't either don't read them or don't understand what they read. Um, I. I'm quite confident that providers um, don't put a whole lot of thought into them and don't even know what's in them. Um, one question is, is what's there actually what is done? Um, throughout bureaucratic life, there are tons of policies that actually are not the ones that are implemented. People ignore their own policies routinely. So that's the first question. But the second question is, I I've never quite understood why if you're going to have a, policy, a privacy statement, you don't just say, um, you know, we adhere to the privacy policies of, and then fill in the blank, your trusted organization. So the patient privacy rights standard privacy policy is the privacy policy we use, or the, you know, um, Pharmaceutical Research Manufacturers Association America privacy policy is the one we use. Um, it seems to me that actually, that sort of good housekeeping model would be a whole lot more intuitive to consumers and actually more versatile over time and more likely to actually be used by the providers who are disclosing it than what they disclose right now. And I've never understood, mainly as a patient, why people haven't taken that you know, reliable brand name privacy rather than just whatever they hand you, who knows what's in it or where it came from. But the deeper point I wanted to make, kind of going to that clinical research in the physician's office, um, factoid um, is that you know if you look back at information flow in healthcare you have to understand that in healthcare and perhaps I should say even in healthcare um, <laughs> we collect the information we need in order to get paid yes let me say that again we collect the information we need in order to get paid okay um, there may be a few systems um, the Mayos, the Geisingers, the Scott and Whites, the Kaisers, who over time have collected information in order to better their clinical operations and serve patients. But by and large, the vast majority of the information that exists in our healthcare system and is all being turned into electronic form is information that exists because it allowed someone to get paid. And um, yeah. the clearest lesson from that is let's start making it so that people only get paid for doing things we really want them to do in healthcare. Um, but then there's a lot more kind of re-engineering where we are to where we want to go, dealing with the fact that so much of the information that's there is there for the wrong reasons and isn't usable for better reasons. Okay, I'm just going to put the housekeeping. We've got five minutes left, so if you have questions, there's one already at the mic, but get up there now and we'll get to you as quickly as we can. John, you've been waiting to get in there. Can you be brief? Really quickly, I mean, the point about uh, vendors, you know, a lot of um, CA Technologies, uh, we are an IT management company, so a lot of our technologies and solutions are used by the providers or used by the hospitals and we will build tools and, and products and solutions when there is a market demand for that and in some cases like the standard we actually are trying to lead the work on that. The point you were making Bill about these policies in our model, in this OASIS uh, PIMRIM model, we actually account for that because we have a novel concept of inherited 
policies, uh, self-generated policies, and exported policies are hope, and, you know, again, no time to get into it. You may inherit a set of policies, and those policies may flow to other providers, other domains, et cetera, other practitioners and other systems. And that's really a key piece of okay. potentially building a standardized set that can be defined and, and exploited. Okay. At the microphone, please introduce yourself. Yes, Jim Piles. Very quickly, I just wanted to uh, mention that the price of a medical record on the, on the black market, according to research, is 50 bucks. Uh, the price of a uh, social security number is $1. That ties in with what uh, uh, Mr. Gordon was saying. Quick comment on uh, Dr. Sage's uh, comments about uh, perhaps a, a better privacy policy and one that adopted individually. Uh, HIPAA uh, provides a floor of privacy protections. And uh, if you, as a practitioner, adopt something above that, then you're held accountable legally for the higher bar. So the, the floor that HIPAA provides has very quickly also become the ceiling. So it is what everyone does, and you pay a legal penalty for going beyond that, and which is too bad, but that's the way it is. I have to say, I'm rather frightened that everybody knows the, the $50 value and the $1 value. Uh, <laughs> yet, yet our keynote speaker spoke of the moral compass of doing this right, and I'm wondering that there isn't a moral compass as a business price for doing it right. Maybe that's our problem. Nick, Nick. Once again, David Smith, I just wanted to comment on a, on a few things that people have said. William, uh, medical system is broken. Uh, so is the software development and IT field. I've been in it 45 years. We do wonderful things. There's an awful lot that isn't getting done well. That's right. John mentioned we need to, some of us need to be making maps for people. We need to remember that making the map for the people is inconvenient for us and there's a lot we don't want them to know. And your suggestion, that we need to understand the system and make it uh, transparent. And the fact is we are churning out electronic patient record systems to chase the money that became available in high tech. We are churning out new HIT professionals when the people who've been in the field for 20 years don't know how to properly encrypt how to keep SSL working properly. And um, we are trying to understand how a hospital works when the administrators of the hospital don't know. And I am scared to death that we are pushing this so hard we're not ready for prime time with this, and that's a personal opinion only. I really hope that's not the ending story of this panel. So <laughs> I do invite what I hope is a more optimistic question. Can you introduce yourself, please? Um, hi, my name is Tatiana Misik. I um, am another student at the GW Health IT program, also at Georgetown's Technology Management Program. Um, and I work for a company that builds Medicaid systems. And yesterday, I was at the Health Data Palooza um, event that is um, taking place uh, today as well. And I heard a lot of, about how government is releasing the data. It's mostly um, de-identified claims data, but I'm sure that there in the future a lot of other data will be released for use, and I heard about innovative ways to use that data to improve health and quality and all that stuff. However, um, there are privacy issues that are, are related to that, and I would like you to discuss um, some of the major ones. Um, of course, the identified data can be re-identified, and what happens with it? Who protects it? Is HIPAA really, is privacy rule really protecting the data? Or, you know, what is going on, and how can we ensure that that data is protected? Um, okay, of course, panelists. not that other you, data you... is not protected either, but. In, in, in as few sentences as humanly possible, <laughs> given the time that we have in front of us, uh, Lily and then Pablo are the two I know for sure. I'm, I'm certain there are others. Who want to speak. Right. There's an IMS health case where the, they de-identified data fields, but they're the ones doing the de-identification and also data mining the records and, and monetizing them. De-identification and re-identification is a much difficult, much more difficult task than is being represented by some out there. Dr. Latanya Sweeney is a great resource on that, and I highly suggest that you look at her work. Thank you. 
Uh, first, Tatiana is one of my most brilliant students, so thank you for a wonderful question. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Regarding the problem with the profession, uh, between 85 and 87, atomic energy produced these computer-controlled radiation machines. And guess what? Due to a software flaw, six people were um, uh, receive overdose of radiation. Three of them died, two of them received irreversible engines. Fast forward now to uh, 2012, those machines are connected to the internet. They could be hacked to look at the radiation radiation levels, they could even be hacked to change the radiation levels. This is very worrying. John. Uh, I think you, the, the concerns that are raised are legitimate. I think, I think you really need to look at privacy as it is understood generally, which includes things like data quality, availability, security, transparency, enforcement, compliance, uh, non-disclosure, where it's pro prohibited, et cetera. You need to take that expansive view, because I think too often we, we have these dialogues and conferences, and then we focus on, on one particular threat area, and we don't look at it holistically. I think that's really critical. The comment about, in effect, the uh, system integrity, assurance, Security, uh, cybersecurity, critical infrastructure protection is right on target. Uh, we don't have time to get into it. Multiple layers here that if you're writing, if you're building your hopes for a fully integrated uh, uh, health information uh, national system, you better pay attention to these other factors, such as availability, network availability, uh, latency, quality of data. Otherwise, we're really moving to a, a world of hurt if we don't uh, if we don't address this. Any last quick comment, Bill? I, I just want to say for the record that I'm an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> what I've been what I've been trying to convey is is ma mainly the point that. Um, First of all, whenever technology changes, there will be opportunities for harm. That was the little bit of the riff on negligence law. But m within healthcare, that um, healthcare is um, ha has a lot of traditions, including traditions around information, that actually have not been very productive uh, considered objectively. And so, it's not just that these technologies are sort of an additional threat. It's that you have to go back now, and I think the, the really good phrase was use case that John mentioned, go back and consider the use case for how information is integrated in a lot of very basic processes in medicine. I think that is an appropriate place to end it. Let me uh, invite you to thank the panelists for their, their contributions. <laughs> and back to Deb.